the time has come, finally, to begin making my algorithm videos. <clears throat> now this has been like basically a year and a half um, of studying the algorithms and toying with them and playing around with them and experimenting and I even had one very long chat that turned into a phone call with eBay. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of information that I'm going to cover over these next four parts that is going to make up uh, everything I've sort of compiled about the eBay algorithms. Um, there's going to be a lot of useful information. Some of it might be boring to some people. So if you are here for like a quick how-to or you were hoping I was going to do like a haul video or whatever, um, I'm only saying this to try to be kind and not waste your time. This is very information heavy and I will probably nerd out. Um, I am actually nervous about making these videos because I am officially, as of the last few years, considered autistic and most of my knowledge and everything that I've really done in my entire life has been based on patterns. Even the more abstract things that I do, like I do paint and I write um, and I overcame a pretty strong speech issue for the most part. I still struggle with it some, but all of that was based on patterns. Like I built it off of patterns. <clears throat> so while I do not have a background in IT, I couldn't even give you a legitimate definition of an algorithm. <laughs> like everything I've gained is by recognizing patterns um, and basically experimenting. So it makes me a little nervous because I have that stigma. Like it's like going back into like really elementary through college when I would like do math and I wouldn't show my work and then teacher would get upset and then ask me to show my work and then when I would show my work I would mess up so then they would assume that I was cheating or something and it always came down to me actually having to get the teacher to stand over me and watch me do the math problem so that they could see that it was actually slowing down and trying to show the work that was interrupting my thought process <laughs> and then they would just let me not do the work um and it's kind of the same scenario here, is this is all based on pattern recognition. Um, but I'm going to go into it as confidently as possible. It's really a big first for me, just coming out in the open and exploring and explaining something that I have derived off of patterns. Um, so, you know, there's a first for everything. Over the next four weeks, I'm going to go into the consistency of listing. I'm going to go into all the little nuances of like your descriptions and your titles and your <sighs> pictures and the overall listing and your item specifics and your inventory and the diversity of your inventory. Um, we'll talk a lot about sales growth and break down a whole bunch of numbers. Um, hopefully it will give you some insight to not only like help you build to the level that you're wanting to build to, hopefully it'll also help you determine whether or not you do want to go full time, whether or not, you know, you want to really seek after those top seller positions and see how far you can grow it. Um... But overall, I think there'll be something here for everyone. Um, we can all do things better. We can all do things differently. And you can take information and, and make it your own. So we are going to dive into it. This first part is not the bulk of my experimentation, actually. Most of it was all the little tiny things that you can do to increase your sales, increase your viewership increase, you know, your turnover rate, your sell-through rate. Um, but the number one thing that most resellers preach is the consistency of listing. So really this, this year, just from January to now almost July, uh, 
I explored the effects of the consistency of listing and try to break it down for newer resellers versus, you know, established resellers. And I played with it. I played with it to some extremes to the point now that I am done poking that bear. Um, and we are going to sort of dive into everything that happened in the last six months as far as my my peaks and my dives and the times that I purposely crashed my algorithms. I am not equating last November, December into this because I did liquidate last November, December very rapidly to move and help take care of my parents. Um, and it kind of maintained my sales because I was selling so many things at auction or at deep discounted prices that even though I wasn't making a whole lot of money versus the work that I was doing, because I was selling so many items between that and it being fourth quarter, which is also a busy time for selling, it kind of maintained the algorithms enough to where it's not really a notable example for what I want to talk about. Um, there is information we can derive from that, but we'll talk about that at a different time. We're going to start at January. So all of December last year, I did not list. I just liquidated. The effects of that really became evident at the beginning of January. In my first week of January, I netted like $35. <laughs> and I started with 91 items in my store. When I moved, I essentially had like two totes and a shoebox of eBay items left that I had saved. And they were all very small items. And that equated to 91 items. Now that was a sharp turn from the 17 plus, 1700 plus items that I had listed prior to my liquidation. Um, so it was kind of, it's kind of a little scary, but I started immediately focusing on rebuilding inventory, sourcing a lot, taking every dime that I made and reinvesting it. I was in a position to where I couldn't necessarily go outside of the house and work. I also had to be cautious about being around a lot of people. So I had to be cautious about how often I went to like Goodwills or estate sales or that kind of thing. I couldn't bring in germs. My, my mom was diagnosed with leukemia. So she was going through chemo at the time and her immune system was practically non-existent most of the time. So I had to be very, very cautious about bringing in COVID or flu during COVID and flu season. So I took that moment of sort of being a primary caregiver and relaxed on income and just focused on building a foundation for where I wanted to go into the future of reselling. And at that point is when I decided I'm going to really play around with the consistency of my listings and I'm going to see how it affects different points of my growth. Um, so we went into it netting $35 that first week of January with 91 items listed. <clears throat> And for, I think it was, I got some notes here, so I don't ramble too much. Um, through January up until about the last four or five days, I listed an average of 30 items a week, which is not very many, not very many at all. It's like 4.5 items or something a day. And then I stopped those last like four or five days of January. I just had an abrupt stop. I didn't list anything for those days. And you will see, which I'll put a picture of this graph. You are going to make fun of me, but I'm a tactile person. So even though I put information into a computer, I'm not going to recognize it as much or, or collect as much information from it as I can, unless I write it down like elementary school graphing. <laughs> this will stick in my mind forever because I've written it. I can stare at a computer all day long and it doesn't it doesn't absorb into my brain. Um, but I am going to use this as my reference point. So I will put like a picture and I'll try to like correspond arrows for what I'm talking about. But I will also show you. I don't know if y'all can even like see everything that's going on. But overall, the biggest thing to take from here, from your point of view, is to really let me make sure. I got a little square. I got a mirror set up behind my phone so I can better, better align, um, is the dips and the peaks, 
That's really what we want to be paying attention to here. So I, I went into it like doing the three items a day and then I stopped and usually the peak is the stopping point um, because you'll peak from all the work you've done and then that sharp downturn when they come along is actually because that week or those days where I wasn't listing is during that peak time and then it drops down. So I did drop down almost to the same level where I began. Not quite, um, but sort of ranging in that 100 to $200 a week um, net for about three weeks. And that's, it's pretty average if you're just barely listing, you're a very casual reseller, or maybe you're a new reseller. Um, so there wasn't a lot of information that I took from that at first. You know, it was kind of what I expected. Um, and I, I turned around from there and I think it was, let me look at my notes again. It was from the end of February to about April 10th, I was listing an average of like between 70 and 80 items a day, which is a little bit more. It's like 10 items a day. Um, it's kind of like in my eyes base level like really you should be doing more than that but that's at least a way to steadily slowly grow you know or especially if you're part-time it's a decent way to grow and maintain inventory is to try to hit that maybe eight to ten items a day level um during that time it did go up fairly significantly um and it was really one of, it, it, technically I think it was the largest rise in sales. With that consistency, um, I did manage to get up to a point to where I was netting around $600 for three weeks in a row. Uh, at that time, during these first two like peaks, um, my inventory never went over 600 items. I think at one point it was close, but it hovered closer to like 500 items. And it also wasn't extremely diverse because again, I had started with that 91 items that were all smaller, knickknack, small ephemera type items that were easy for me to move with me. And then I didn't really go into listing clothing a lot. I didn't do a lot of like bigger value items or even bigger items in general. It was mostly smaller items. Um, at that point I was listing off of my bed in my bedroom because I hadn't been able to establish like a space for myself. So I had to keep my inventory pretty small and I had to make it something that was easy for me to like basically sit on my bed and list. <laughs> so, you know, I can do a whole bunch of board games and puzzles and, and bigger collectibles and things like that because I would just, it wasn't manageable. Um, so it wasn't super diverse during that time and I peaked and sort of capped at about 600. So once I started to see that consistency in that like three weeks of like back to back pretty much right on point $600, um, I decided to crash my algorithms again. Um, so I did abruptly stop right around April 10th and I went another four or five days not listing at all. And in that not listing at all for just the four or five days, um, my sales actually dropped for three weeks in a row, resulting in overall like a 300% drop. Um, it was a little bit slower drop than one of the other peaks and dives that I took, but it even though it was only like a four to five day period that I stopped, when I started relisting again, it took longer, it continued to drop and took longer to come back up. Um, and this was again right after sort of reestablishing my inventory. So then during that whole period, I was still just basically reinvesting my inventory like crazy. And at that point I started paying even closer attention to profit margins, which I'm a big profit margins person. Like, 
I do not do the whole buy $5 and sell it for $25 or $30. Absolutely not. If I get stuck doing that or if it's something I just really love, sometimes I'll do it. Um, I do not like to do that. Uh, I will sell $5 items, but I'll pay $0.20 cents for them or $0.50 cents at most. Um, so I'm a big profit margins person. And so at that point, I really started to pay attention. I started to buy higher end items, more quality items, looking for really good name brand clothing, really good vintage clothing, um, bigger collectibles, glassware, you know, plates and saucers. And pretty much at that point, it was just like anything was game. So my inventory strongly diversified. And at that point, I started listing about, it depended on the week, but between 100 and 140 items per week. And I did that over like, I think it was like a three or four week period. And they started to climb again. Now they did do some sort of like slight dips and dives. Uh, at one point, I think it dropped like, I don't know, it's like 80% or something um, right towards the end there. But I did grow it up to actually getting up to a $700 net. So listing more items per week uh, or per day, um, closer to that 20 item per day mark, 15 to 20 item per day mark. Um, I was able to beat the previous cap of 600 and push it up to the $700 net. Now, again, this is net. So, I want to pause really quick and explain something because you'll hear a lot of resellers be like, I had a $2,400 a week. Well, that's all fine and dandy. But for instance, like February, between February and between February 1st and February 29th, all of February, I had a gross of $2,257.36. Now my eBay net was $1,440.66. So you're talking like $800 a strong, like $800 less than what many people will say they made, you know. Uh, the pretty standard average um, selling cost is around 30-35%. It depends on if you promote your listings, which we'll talk about at some point. There are pros and cons to that. Um, I use it as a tool for certain items. I don't recommend it for everything, but I do use it for some things. Um, but your sales costs a lot of times will end up averaging somewhere around a 30%, 30-35%. Uh, I would like to get mine lower, and I know that I can because that's one thing I've done in a lot of businesses previously is I would get obsessive about their, their cost, their labor cost, their cost of goods and all that, and I would do inventory, and I would just, it wasn't even my position half of the time. Like, sometimes I would just be like a hostess or like a line cook, and I would be like, hold on, let me look at your numbers. Um, so... I can get that down and I aim to do that. It hasn't been a priority yet, but that puts things into perspective a little bit. When I'm talking about a $700 net, like you're, you know, you're looking closer to like a thousand dollar, somewhere around thousand, eleven hundred dollar, um, gross. And again, that eBay net does not include what you invested in the item. It does not include your expenses, your taxes. So you want to take that in consideration. We'll talk about that plenty over the next four um, videos. Really, I talk about it a lot, especially in like my haul videos and stuff like that. I really push people to look at their actual true net profit because it is nowhere near what is mostly advertised and I think it's very dangerous not to know your numbers and going into this especially if you're quitting your job to do this 
Um, so when I talk about these nets, understand that I did not gross $700. I eBay netted $700, um, which is a significant, it's a good solid amount, especially coming out of 91 items at the beginning of the year. Um, but that did start to drop off. Um, and I had that 80% drop, um, because right towards, it was like towards the end of April, I think like April 21st or so, I took another four to five day period and I didn't list. And so you see, you actually see the dive here. And again, it takes like two to three weeks to fully like go down. But even in that time... Again, I started like listing a few items. I wasn't listing like crazy numbers or anything, but I was listing somewhat consistently. And despite listing consistently, because I'd already driven my sales up to this point by listing a much higher number, my sales were not recuperating. So as they started to dive, I decided, all right, Now's the time I'm going to just full on poke this bear. I'm going to see what happens. And I decided to go to extremes. And I started, it was leading up towards Memorial Day. And for nine days, over the course of nine days, I listed 700 items. And that's like a strong 70 to 80 items a day. Like pushing out listings. Um, I can do 100, 120 in a day. It's kind of taxing on the body a little bit because whether you're sitting or standing or rotating sitting and standing, you get kind of, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> you can do it, but it can get difficult um, if you're doing it days and days and days in a row. So I did keep it at that like 70 to 80 a day. And I did the 700, about, I think it ended up being like 696 items in nine days. And that is where you will see this giant spike. And I grew my cells essentially, I think it was like 300%. Something like that. Um, 200, 230 or something like that. But I grew them very rapidly. Um, and... That was from listing all of those items over a short period of week. Now, what you'll notice that is sort of different about these other peaks is that these were is where I started to become more consistent in my listing, and then they would sort of cap over a period of time, and it would be a little bit slower growth. Well, in this dive, I just full on listed like all these items, and it peaked within one week. So within seven of those nine days, listing at that consistency, my sales like skyrocketed basically. And I netted a little over $1,000. Um, then about two days into that week where I peaked, I just stopped, stopped. And I stopped for seven days, which felt really weird as a established reseller to not like even... In all my part-time years, I would still list, you know, at least two or three times a week. So to go seven days without listing, it just felt really weird. And literally my anxiety started to grow <laughs> because it was like there was this thing I felt like I needed to be doing. And I kept having to tell myself, that's not what we're doing. We're trying to experiment here. So in that one week... It peaked and then it nosedived. So I think it took like a 200% drop and it landed me, I think it was like $368 net sales that, that following week. So remember all these, the, this all happened in the course of three weeks. I went from point A rose my cells by like 200 something percent, crashed them by really even a slightly higher percentage, and it was a very rapid thing. So 
at that point I seeing seeing what happened that's when I was like all right so this is my last experiment because one thing you can do is you can you can sort of semi permanently make the algorithms upset um I have learned over this last year and a half that there are on some level and I don't know the ins and outs of, outs of this because I don't have that insider information but there are brackets I can tell you now that there are brackets there are you know obviously top seller is one of them like if you have a top seller rating um you're obviously gonna have your items push towards the top but even outside of the top seller rating there are brackets and even within the top seller rating depending on how your sales are going how your listings are designed and and handled and many many other elements you can be put into these little brackets that you don't really want to be in because they will start to cap you off and <laughs> there's been weeks so the the phone call with eBay was a result of me recognizing that I was consistently pushing to this higher level but I would still every week get close to the same net sales and this actually happened towards the towards me liquidating and then I had a separate phone call this last year but I would essentially no matter how much I listed or how much I worked I would hit a level and I could not get past that level and I, again, don't know exactly how they work that system, but I did get that fixed. <laughs> um, that took some maneuvering on my part, um, which we'll discuss at some other time. But you don't want to shove yourself in a bracket, is my point. And at this point, I decided, yeah, I'm done poking this bear. So I have derived all the information I want from this, and... At this point, leading going forward, um, as of today, like today I'm probably going to list 40 to 50 items tonight. I mean, it's already evening. Um, and then I'm going to consistently, over the next week and a half, all the way till next Friday, uh, July 6th, no, July 5th, I'm going to list 70 to 80 items again to sort of cap myself back up again and then I'm gonna stick to the 30 to 50 items a day and over the course of these algorithm videos that I post we'll kind of go back and look and see how that's playing into everything um, one I'm gonna see how quickly I recuperate and two we will see what that consistency is doing to my seller level um, but as far as like things that I sort of gained from this, uh, one, your consistency affects you far more as a new reseller. With that being said, I first want to say, and this is sort of like a warning of caution, I guess maybe is the right word. When you are new to selling, it is in eBay's best interest to retain you as a reseller. Um, meaning that you get certain leniencies, you get more exposure than you've earned, because I guess a good sort of analogy here and it may disturb some of you but I think it's probably the best analogy I can come up on the spot is like when you're a newborn and your mother is like breastfeeding you <laughs> she's giving you immunity through certain to certain like viruses and such that's one of the benefits of of feeding your child that way um once that stops that's when you'll start to see a child start to be exposed or when they're exposed get 
seek more often. <laughs> Essentially, eBay is breastfeeding their new resellers because they want to allow them to thrive long enough so that they retain those those sellers. At some point, and I don't know how long this period lasts or at what point things start to become a bigger issue, but at some point that starts to dissipate and so it is reasonably easy to start growing in the beginning if you follow very basic principles like consistently listing and you know having decent like listings themselves like filling out things and posting pictures and having good inventory that has high sell-through rates if you follow very base level things in the beginning then you're gonna have some amount of growth but at some point things start to affect you a lot more um, especially when you're in competition with all of these these very established resellers you have to outcompete them like your listing has to be better than their listing your price points have to be better your everything I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole because that'll be for another video but everything has to be on point um, however while that that sort of nurturing period of eBay is going on consistency is a big thing they don't want you to go and throw 200 items on there, which I don't think you can. Like, I haven't been a new reseller in so long. I know they tear you up like 10, 100, 250, that kind of thing. But I don't know what levels those are at now. But they they sort of cap people off so that they can't just have a free-for-all and list thousands of items. And they don't know who this seller is or if they're nefarious or if they competent enough to maintain that sales level um, but whatever level they allow you to list up to you don't want to do that all in one day one eBay doesn't like that that signals like caution for them for their algorithms because you may not have a good system for shipping yet you may not even know what you're doing yet so that's a big risk to have someone selling a lot of items right out the gate Two, if you hit that cap too soon and you don't convert that into sales, you can't list anything more. So your algorithms are automatically going to crash because you can't even list items. And if you do want to list more items, you're going to have to end other items, which can also affect your algorithms. So that consistency in the beginning is very important. But looking at this, consistency is less important once you're established. Um, one, I'm sure that Mother eBay has recognized that you are competent and you have a history and you have fit into a bracket. Um, like I'm in the top seller bracket, you know. Um, I also have a long history with them. So generally speaking, my my listings are going to get a lot of views. They're going to have a lot of impressions. They're going to get a lot of views. I'm going to convert a lot of sales. Um, or more so at least than some someone who's beginning. But from these graphs and these numbers, um, not only did that consistent listing not necessarily pull me out of the dive fast enough, but what did pull me out of the dive was hella listing. <laughs> like, just going hardcore with it. Because at that point, there's no more restraints on how much I can list in a day. And listing like crazy, from these numbers and from my experience this these last six months, can significantly increase your sales. And that's not just like a baseline you're feeding the algorithm monster like they're seeing you list 70 items and some magic you know wizard of oz in the back back behind some curtain is like okay open the floodgates and let everybody buy her items no it's 
it's it's pretty simple. You're listing a whole bunch of items, so you're getting more impressions, so you're getting more views, so people are watching more of your items, hopefully. Um, and that's converting into sales. And as you sell more items, because you're listing more items and they're getting more views, that is feeding into your algorithms. If you're converting a lot of sales, that definitely affect, affects the algorithms. Like eBay wants sellers who are who are listing things and selling them quickly. They don't want it sitting forever, um, which you can have long tail inventory, but we'll get into that in a minute. They want converted sales. That is how they make their money. <laughs> that is that is the best outcome for this, especially since, you know, they used to charge by the month, you know, like if you wanted to list an item, like every 30 days, it would charge you like another 30 cents or whatever. They had various different fee structures in the past. And those were very much like, when they didn't have the ability to store the gabillions and gabillions of listings that they now are capable of, of maintaining, they charged for the amount of time that it was listed. And so every period when you were charged again, the value of your item, what you could potentially make off the item was dropping. Well, now that's all gone. Like you can list, you know, it's, you get a subscription, a store subscription, and you can list it basically indefinitely, you know? And because of that, the algorithms are geared towards making a quicker sale. So if you're making quicker sales, um, or you're selling a lot per week, then you are going to keep making consistent sales. Um, and that all comes from impressions and views and watchers, you know, like if you don't have people looking at your stuff, then you're not going to sell anything. So in itself, listing an enormous amount of items, like 709 days, you're just boosting like everything all at once. And, um, it will significantly and rapidly increase your sales. Uh, not to mention um, your, when you're established, you're going to have a, a higher inventory level. Um, the only exception are like well-known eBay YouTubers. <laughs> And some of them even have high inventory levels, but some of them have such a strong viewership, like buyer relationship where many of their viewers buy items from them. Most of them are females. Um, they, they don't even have to maintain a very high inventory level because they're selling things so quickly to their viewers that, I mean, that, that must be nice, but <laughs> that, uh, it also kind of scares me in some ways, but like you have to maintain, you have to be able to source like constantly in that environment. And you also have to keep your viewers happy, which means at some point you just have to do whatever they tell you to do. Um, anywho, so everything I took from this, um, and everything that I hope to take from this is one is I really want to see if I can save this week. Again, today I'm going to list like 40 to 50 items and then I'm going to start into the 70, 80 again. As of 2 p.m. today, Wednesday, what is it, 25th, 26th? It's Wednesday of this week. Um, I've netted $26. <laughs> That's horrible. Uh, I will say that that will be okay. Um, one thing I want to say really quickly on the brackets thing is one thing I started to notice middle of last year and actually put into this discussion that I had with eBay was there has to be some sort of something that is 
pushing their best resellers forward on the weekends and their peak periods and their other resellers towards the Monday and Tuesday. And at first I was like, that doesn't make sense because I noticed there were certain periods where almost all of my sales were happening on Mondays and Tuesdays, which seems so weird because most people get paid, you know, sometime between Wednesday and Friday and they have their disposable income over the weekend and that's when they tend to make more purchases. I mean, that's like restaurants are busier, retail is busier, everything's busier over the weekend. So why were most of my sales happening on Monday and Tuesdays? Well, once I sorted th some things out, very swifty, swiftly I became a Wednesday through Sunday seller. And the vast majority of my sales happened like Fridays and Saturdays. And part of what threw me off this off is when I've restarted in the past or when I very first started, I mostly made all my sales on Fridays and Saturdays. Again, it goes back to nurturing re new resellers. In the beginning, you're probably going to make more sales on Fridays and Saturdays. But if you mess up and you keep messing up, you're going to get put on the bench. And when it started to make sense to me is when I applied it to my previous restaurant experience. And over the, the weekends is when you had your best staff. You had your best fastest cooks most accurate cooks you had your fastest dishwasher you had your most friendly hostesses who knew how to clean a table and you had all your best servers with the best personalities who could turn over tables really quickly because that's when you had most of your business you can't put your b team out when you need your your a game you know so if you keep messing up you're gonna before they completely bench you, you're going to end up noticing that you're selling most of your stuff on Mondays and Tuesdays at some point. And if you're a part-time reseller who's very casually doing this, it, you might not be doing anything wrong. But this was what happened in my situation is I was still sort of casually listing and I wasn't really pushing to higher inventory levels. I wasn't pushing my day-to-day -day listings. Um, and I was just sort of consistently doing like 10 to 20 a day. I was doing most of my sales like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And that rapidly changed when I switched into a more full-time business mind. Um, now, if you really, really keep messing up, you'll just, I mean, they'll even stop you from reselling. So you really want to be cautious about <laughs> certain things, which we'll discuss in another video. Um, but I do want to see if I can save this week at 26 net, $26 net on Wednesday. Um, I've seen worse when I've done these crashes. So I would imagine I can end up at like four or $500, which actually I think last week I did 500 when I started coming back. Cause after that deep dive, I just started listing like, I think I listed like 180 items in two days and then I just started sort of straggling in listings again and it crept back up a little bit um and I ended up around $500 net after the crash so I'm pretty sure I can end up somewhere around four to five hundred dollars I'll be curious to see though how quickly the results of me going back into this hardcore listing starts to pay off um, and then we're going to start looking over the next few weeks and see how that affects the next couple weeks and then also how the consistency affects them. Um, at some point, if you take all of this information and you understand that consistency works in a new reseller's favor best, consistency can help an established reseller. Not only do you create a schedule, but you're maintaining your sales. It does still appear from this information and from my prior knowledge over the last year that how many you're listing per day, no matter how consistent it is, will eventually cap you off. Now, part of that's just because the numbers behind the views and the impressions and all that, but... I think it's a little deeper than that. Um, 
And at that point is when you have to start making bigger decisions. So I'm saying this part because if you are a reseller who's pushing towards being a full-time reseller and you really want to make good sustainable money, or if you're a seasoned reseller and you've noticed that you're just not breaking through to the next level, um, one, you probably want to up your game. I would say increase your number of listings per day by 10 or 20 and see how that starts to affect it. But at some point, you're going to max out. Like, I could do consistently maybe 67, 70 items a day. It would be tough alone by myself. There are six digit resellers who are grossing like 300k a year who tend to do 50 items a day but they have employees so for me to do a consistent 60 70 items a day by myself and packaging all of those sales and listing all those items and especially sourcing that much inventory that's a lot of inventory to source especially if you're trying to keep your profit margins pretty high or your your value per item pretty high that it it's possible I don't know that it's sustainable without hiring an employee so I will probably cap out at about 50 items a day consistently because I think that will sort of max out how much I have to organize how much I have to process how much I have to shift the shipping materials I have to order and handle all the bookkeeping, extra bookkeeping I have to do, all the extra sourcing I have to do, and all the listing I do. That's a lot of work. Um, in that 50 items a day, without an employee, I can probably work my way up steadily to netting somewhere, you know, between a thousand, two thousand dollars. And that's like net. Um, like when I talk about the 300k a year, that's gross for them. <laughs> so it's very much different but I I think I could fe feasibly work my way up to that without an employee at all um, but to sort of get through those caps the things you want to look at is like are you marketing at all you can you can build your sales by doing social media posts um, if you're out and about and you notice somebody likes to collect a certain type of item or whatever, give them a card. I know that's sort of old school, but I mean, anything you can do to get that information out to where they might see that again, because you can tell them about your, your store, but are they going to remember that later to look it up? But if you have a card and they end up tossing it around, they'll end up seeing that card again and they might actually think to look it, into it. Um, anything you can do to sort of market yourself, including YouTube. One of the smartest things I've seen recently is new resellers starting YouTube as they start reselling. Because one, I can tell you right now, me starting YouTube after being a long-term seasoned reseller and me trying to throw that into my schedule and everything that I already know to do, has maxed me out <laughs> like it is a lot to take on when you're already somewhat established because you have to rearrange things you have to think about like the order in which you do things like you you're having to restructure yourself around a viewership and that can be complicated if you build that at the beginning awesome especially if you build viewers who have seen you start in the beginning and move all the way forward even better like because they've seen your growth but on top of it I've actually started to follow some of these individuals and while I cannot learn much from them as far as reselling at this point what I am out of touch on is what it's like to be a new reseller it's been so long since I've been a, renew a new reseller I don't know what they're up against I don't know what's selling for them and what's not I don't know what they're their sales growth looks like I don't know I don't know any of that which I find it funny that so many so many like established resellers whether they're on YouTube or just talking to other people in general they want to they want to act like I can I can get you started I know exactly what you need but in reality they can give you the basics 
Like they can tell you how to make a listing or take good pictures or like some things. They can help you navigate some things, but they don't have insight of what it's actually like to be a new reseller. So on some level, if they're not studying new resellers, then they're missing out on this whole segment of information that could be useful in their teaching ability. Um, so I've started to follow new resellers. Um, the other thing you can do if you're capping out, and this is more extreme, like if you're really trying to grow full time and you need a sustainable income and you need to net at least 50, 60, 70, 80 K a year, hire an employee. I know it sounds scary. It sounds crazy. I'm not going to do it for another six months because I'm going to end up moving again. And I don't like not giving people job security. I'm also not going to hire until I hit a certain number that I'm netting because I also want to give them job security. I don't want to come so close to being able to pay them and then something happened and it dips down and I have to let them go because they're too expensive. Um, I'm also not going to hire them till I can pay them at least $20 an hour. And I know that sounds like a lot, but I'm not going to have somebody set aside 10, 20 hours of their week and I can't make it worth their time. At this point in time, anything below $15 an hour is just, why? <laughs> like, what? like, you can't get a McDonald's meal for $15, barely. So, I have certain things that I have to meet before I will hire someone. But as soon as I meet those things, I will absolutely hire someone part-time, probably a college student or like a mother who has a couple days a week. Um, because they can do all of my processing. They can do my laundry, not my personal laundry, but like all my clothes can get washed or steam cleaned or whatever they need to be done, de de-linted. They can wash all my glassware. They can dry erase my shoes, like very easy things. And then I can start to get them into taking pictures. And at some point in the two or three hours I'm gone sourcing in a day, they can do all my processing and take most of my pictures for that day or all my pictures for that day. And then I just come home and list. And when you can just streamline listing and you don't got to stop and process anything, you don't even have to stop and take pictures. That's when you start really pumping out listings. <laughs> so it sounds counterintuitive, like you're just making it and then you got to hire someone, but the amount of growth you're going to have after hiring somebody who you can afford to pay, please don't do it if you cannot afford to pay them, is going to be awesome. Uh, another way you can manage capping out is cutting your costs. Again, I'm going to lower my overall percentage, you know, my selling cost. Um, right now it's averaging about 35%. I want to try to get that on eBay paper down to 30 and then I'm going to be a little more extreme and see if I can cut it even lower because the reality is I have other costs that is not on the eBay paper. Um, you can also start to sell on other platforms. Um, some platforms are just better for certain items. So sometimes you'll have a, a faster sell through rate for clothing on a different platform. Um, or younger fashions on Depop or, you know, wherever you want to land. Uh, sometimes if you have a lot of quantity of stuff that you just really want to get, get rid of quickly and you're okay not getting full retail value, go on whatnot, have a live auction. You can increase your income by selling on other platforms also. Um, I would say just be very cautious and understand what sells on what platform and which one is the the max for your item. You don't want to take the easy way out on anything. Um, you can raise the overall value of your item. Right now I'm trying to keep it around $30 per item. I would like that to go up at some point. Um, but if your average is like $15, $20 uh, per item, you can definitely get that up. And it will benefit you a lot to really focus on the values of your items, also your profit margin. Because if you're putting less money out, 
then when you make that sell, you're you're getting more money in. So, and you also have less money called up in inventory. Uh, and then the last biggest thing is to get through that cap is you can create a YouTube or something like that. YouTube is probably not long term the only option. A lot of younger generations see YouTube as like the older generation's TV. Um, most of Gen Z, they don't really get on YouTube as much anymore. So at some point you will want to look at doing content on other platforms and monetizing on those platforms, but YouTube is a good place to start. And even if you haven't monetized, um, you get views. You get viewers, you get subscribers, and those people will see things that they want to buy. Um, I do want to comment, now that we're at this point, that you will cap at a certain level. The vast majority of really top tier resellers have even either really invested in more space and employees and are are really dealing in in bulk inventory or something of that nature to really get them to that level or they have a YouTube channel and they have a strong strong viewership now you'll hear a lot of them say oh I don't actually get that many viewer purchases and I say bullshit now, I'm not saying that they knowingly know that that's bullshit, but I do think it's weird that so many of them downplay how many purchases are made by viewers, because why would you do, like, I don't really know why that's such a big sticking point for them. Like, I'm not going to get into that psychology, although I have, I have theories, but I'm not going to go down that road. Um... But the reality is, is that you have viewers who want you to know that they are supporting you. So they will buy something and they will tell you that they are a viewer. You may even say, hey, tell me you're a viewer and I'll give you 10% off. And they want that discount. And they're going to think to do that because they're going to get that discount. That's a portion. In my mind, honestly, if I'm being completely honest based off the patterns that I've recognized, I would say your viewer purchases are only about 10 to 20% of those individuals who actually tell you they're a viewer and they're purchasing. Because the reality is, is there's a whole nother big segment of people and their personalities who do not want that recognition. They don't want to be called out for it. They don't even feel the need to let you know that they're supporting you. Because a lot of people believe in supporting people without getting recognition for it. They just want to do like a good thing. And a lot of people have even been raised that it's not appropriate to do nice things and then to talk about it. And I'm not saying that that is or is not true. I'm just saying that there's a lot of people who have been raised that way. That's their mentality is that you, you are supportive and you do things, but you don't necessarily say that you're doing it. So there's a, another big chunk, and I think that that's actually bigger than the ones who say that they're doing, they're buying because they're a viewer. I think there's a much bigger chunk of people who are supporting you and want to support you who are not telling you. But then there's this whole other chunk of people who just see something that you bought and it makes them think, oh, I never even knew that still existed or I haven't thought about that in forever. I want to buy that. And they get on your, they get on eBay and they buy it from you. They're not even thinking about supporting you. They're just <laughs> reflexively buying because your YouTube is essentially a commercial. That is very normal and that happens quite a bit. Um, I can tell you even just in the spike, because I, I had a pretty small like subscriber base and then all of a sudden it started to spike. And just in that spike alone, that first little spike, and I only have like 237 subscribers, very quickly I noticed that items that had been sitting for a long time were selling, items that I had like put in my videos were selling much faster than I expected them to, sometimes within two to three days of me putting the video out. 
And these are items that typically, from the 18 years of my experience, would sit for three to six months because they're niche or they're just not highly sought after or they don't have as many keywords around them. Um, items that I had made a big deal about finding or selling very quickly after putting the video out. And I only know of two viewers and they didn't even tell me, but I recognize their name from the user because I get so few comments and subscribers. I recognize their name from their username was on the label. And so I only know that those two viewers bought from me because I recognize their names. And it was like very obviously first and last names. It wasn't like, you know, just a general first name. But I can guarantee you that I've had other viewer purchases that I'm not aware of. And I don't even have thousands and thousands of followers. So if you're feeling super frustrated, <laughs> because I've felt this many times over the last year and a half of me trying to be full time. And you feel like you're capping. And you've, you've really cut your costs and you're changing your inventory. And you're building a, a more diverse inventory. And you're consistently listing and you're even pushing yourself to list more and you're doing all these things and it should be working and you're still capping out and not hitting the level of these really top level resellers, don't beat yourself up because either you're going to have to hire and expand or you're going to have to create content. just being realistic. Now my throat hurts. I got passionate. Um, so don't be down on yourself. And you can do either one of those. I have faith in you to do either one of those. Be smart about it. Do your homework. Figure out who you want to be. That was a big thing of me going into YouTube. Is so many, it's unfortunate, but so many females, like, they have to do certain things to like really build their viewership and so I was like all right when I first started I was like all right I have to show up in makeup every day and I have to have like a white light and I have to have like perfectly white teeth and I have to like do all these things and I have to have this super sparkly personality and that's not me and so like when I first started, like I started to get frustrated because I was like, I'm never going to be able to sustain this. Like I will just lose my mind. Um, and so I, I took a step back and I was like, who do I want to be? And how, how important it is to me to be who I am and what am I capable of doing without just losing my mind? And I arrived at a point to where I wanted to really just be myself the best that I can and obviously I would like to grow more confident because that's something I've been on, on a journey to do anyways but I'm gonna be quirky and weird I'm gonna come with a lot of knowledge and sometimes it's gonna be boring to people and I have a lot of crazy stories of like very I have had a very thick and traumatic life <laughs> So I come with a lot of life experiences and stories and, and just things like that. And I'm, I'm just never going to show up like super bubbly and I'm not going to just hide all of that. I've, I've done that for most of my life. Like I just got to a place to where I feel like I can be more myself. Why was I going to create a YouTube trying to fit a mold? So point is, is decide if you're going to create content, who you want to be and play to your strengths because you were, will attract the viewers that you want and you will like the ones who don't like you are going to be so, so repulsed <laughs> that they're probably going to make some comments about it. But most of the time they're just going to go away. You know, so sort of a law of attraction. You just, just be yourself. Decide what you want to be, play to your strengths, build your content, or get real business minded, crunch the numbers, see if you can hire someone, see if you can rent a really cheap, affordable place to store more inventory or to create a better process, like a more streamlined process, or just even add on to your home somehow with garages or sheds or a spare bedroom that you weren't using. Uh, get creative with it. You can expand. 
you can build content and you can come through that cap. If you're a new reseller, be consistent. Just be consistent until they take the, the leash off. <laughs> and then once they do that, just be very cautious. Like, make wise decisions. Don't purposely crash your algorithms five times in a year uh, right out the gate. Wait about 18 years to do that. <laughs> and then uh, see how far you can push it. Uh, so yeah, that is pretty much all. I do want to say that... Um, some quick things that can help you in this moment is I did learn that sort of your basic store subscriptions you will be put in a higher tier if you get that better store subscription. Now I, I come in the middle ground. Um, I can't remember what they call call it. I'll try to put it up here on the screen because I get word mixed up. But if you pay for if you have them draft it from your account like every month, it ends up being like $55, $59 or something like that. You also get a coupon every quarter for $50 off of eBay shipping, which I spend on like bubble mailers. So that sort of pays me back some of that subscription fee too. You get to list a lot more items so you don't have to worry too much about like if your items are rolling over or like maxing out at any point um, because I'm probably never going to list 10,000 items in a month. <laughs> and uh, there are other perks to that, but in my experience, it also affects your algorithms. It puts you in a different bracket, um, because if you're willing to spend a little bit more, eBay is willing to keep you a little bit more. Um, build strong habits in the beginning. If you have already started and you are not organized or you don't have a good structure or you're prone to buying things with a hot, uh, lower profit margin, start looking into how you can build strong habits around those things. Habits are actually fairly easy to build. I didn't think that until recently when I started going through a business coaching class where I teach or coach people in business. And I learned that habit building is actually fairly easy. You're just brainwashing yourself. Um, those habits go a long, long way. Especially when you start to get burnout. Your habits are there to basically keep you afloat. Um, aim for the top rated seller position. You can't get that right out the gate. You have to work towards that. But if you keep your defect rate lo lo low and you have certain uh, standards of shipping and that kind of thing, you can definitely work your way up to top rated seller and that will boost your, your uh, listings. Um, build a consistent, strong inventory with a lot of variety because the more variety you have, especially in this market, used to, you can make 100000 a year on mugs or cookbooks when eBay first started. That is not the case anymore, and I very strongly discourage only having like three or four specialized items. Like, I'm not picking on guys because a lot of women will mostly just do clothing and handbags. Fine, whatever. Um, guys, a lot of times they'll do like electronic shoes and video games. Uh, in this market, with the platforms exploding and the casual resellers coming in in the hordes, I strongly recommend diversifying your eBay, especially if you want to grow to a very top-level reseller. Um, because one, you're going to be going up against already established resellers in those niches, and you don't really want to do that. Um, it's a lot of it's a lot more work getting in the door that way um but two no matter what happens there's always somebody looking at your inventory like always there's never a time where there's like not anyone like i i have like millions and millions of impressions because there's always somebody looking and 
uh, you're pretty much always going to sell something. That is one reason that even when I took these crazy dives, I didn't come back down here. Because at this point, I had diversified my inventory to a point to where my diverse inventory kept me afloat. Because I always had something to sell to someone. Um, and at that point, the algorithms, while they're important, they weren't the only factor anymore. It was also just the diversity of my inventory. Um, you want to have your consistency at first. And then it's all about just having really strong pra business practices. Consistency mixed with strong business practices and every time you want to level up, just really dive in and push yourself. Mm. The last thing I want to talk about, and this has probably been like eight hours, an hour and 11 minutes, um, is I recommend having an emergency inventory. Some resellers call it a death pile. And many resellers, which kind of baffles me, honestly, I'm not sure if it's like, I don't know if it's a lack of experience or if they just haven't been put in certain situations in life or I don't really know how this hasn't become a thing. But if you are, if you have built your sales to where you're needing to list 30 to 50 items a day and you're trying to bring in like a net of $2,000 a week or some crazy business like that and you have zero back stock inventory because you don't want to have a death pile and you want to list everything as soon as it comes in, what happens when you break your leg? And you can't drive because your driver leg is broken. What happens when you get really sick? What happens when something tragic happens or something comes up? Life happens. Newton's law. If it's going to happen, it will happen. Or it will happen if it's what can happen is going to happen. You know what I'm talking about. Life sucks sometimes <laughs> and you get thrown off course. And sourcing that amount of inventory when you have no back stock inventory in a time where you can't walk properly or you're in pain or you're in the hospital or you're having to fly out to be with a family member who may be in a very tragic state or there are hundreds and hundreds of possibilities. You're, even if you put your store in vacation mode, your algorithms can take a dive and you might not be able to recuperate from that. Because I also don't recommend ever putting your store in vacation mode for more than seven days. And honestly, I feel like that's kind of pushing it because those individuals who do make purchases, you're going to have to communicate with them very strongly that that is not being shipped until a certain day. And most buyers aren't going to want to wait more than two weeks to receive the item that they purchase. So very quickly, you can get to a point to where even if you manage to source some inventory, you're not maintaining the level at which you've grown. So I personally keep a 300 item back stock inventory. You can do it in as many as like three or four bins if you're smart about it. You can get little knickknacks, you can get ephemera, you can get small little items, cassette tapes or, or CDs or accessories or whatever, jewelry. Um, they don't even have to be high sell through rate, they don't even have to be high value, but have an emergency inventory in case something comes up and you can't source. Not only that, but even if you get a minor cold or food poisoning, full-time resellers are at great risk of burnout because we essentially never get a day off. Even when we go in vacation mode, we still have to answer messages. We still have to do some level of work and you can get burnt out very quickly. If you end up getting really sick for even three or four or five days and your body is really worn down, you're at even higher risk of burnout and you're going to have to come back fighting even harder. 
So why not just have that little cushion there? It doesn't mean that you're a hoarder. Right now I got plenty of inventory, but I have a growth plan. <laughs> like this was, this is planned. Um, but even when I get through a good portion of this, at the end of it, I will have at least 300 items. That gives me a 10 day window of listing 30 items a day. That's not very long. 10 days, 30 items a day for whatever chaos has happened in my life. Um, so I don't think it's a death pile if you're using it as protection to your business. It is your security fund. It's your emergency fund. It's a savings account. Um, so that is all. This went a little bit longer than I planned. The next two and three probably won't be as long, but the this is just a week. The numbers, they're just weird. Um, the rest will be more about all the things you can do and how you can do them to build and maintain your algorithms. Um, and we'll talk about different ways of diversifying inventory. We'll talk about your listings. We'll talk about all that good stuff. I hope I haven't just bored the absolute crap out of y'all. I hope I was coherent and I made sense. Believe it or not, I rehearsed this like eight times. <laughs> I tried to narrow down the nerdiness as much as I could, the awkwardness. Uh, but yeah, I am going to start editing this because the editing process is going to be longer. The uploading process is going to be longer. And then I'm going to turn around and edit my picking video for midweek also. I hope y'all have a good night. I will be back sometime next week. I'll talk about how and if I recouped my net sales for this week. And then we'll start to examine the other things. Y'all have a good one.